I think the big, big, big thing that no one really talks about, but we have been talking about today, is the nature of money itself and the nature of the banking system itself. And Islamic banks are no different to conventional banks in that sense, in that they do also benefit from this power of money creation. And I think that is the main thing that we need to solve. Solve that and you solve 90% of the other issues. Have you ever felt that nagging, slightly dissatisfied feeling with Islamic financial products as they are today? But what if it didn't have to be that way? What if there was a different kind of financial system that actually did work and was truly Islamic? And so I got writing and I wrote a 13,000 word essay on the topic, which is actually linked in the description below. But I appreciate many people don't have the time to read all of that. So in this video, what we're going to do is have a podcast discussion about those topics so that it breaks it down for those of you who haven't read the article. And as we go along, if there are certain topics that need a bit of a deep dive, we'll do that as well as we go along. Mr. Muhammad, over to you. Oh, how the tables have turned, Ibrahim. Welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to be on <laughs> the IFG podcast. Finally. So 13,000 words is a lot of words. That's a, basically a dissertation, right? Um, why would you embark on this in the first place? I, well, I think there's, uh, there's a real issue at the moment where people feel a, a sense of dissatisfaction with Islamic financial products. And I think that dissatisfaction at heart arises because the Islamic finance industry and the investment products and financial products are a dot on a timeline. And unfortunately, that dot isn't moving along the timeline. And I think the reason why there isn't that movement is because no one has properly spent time to articulate what the end goal looks like. What does a truly Islamic financial system look like? At least maybe people have done it. I, I've not kind of come across it. And so I started thinking about it for myself, frankly, right? You know, we work in Islamic Finance Guru. We've got the investment arm, Curate Capital. What are we trying to actually do here? And where are we trying to go with this? Um, and so I think that was a big important reason why I wanted to write it for myself. Because I think if you are, uh, if you're saying that we are living in a casino, and you've got this room where there's a big Muslim population. And that Muslim population has said, look, we're going to use the casino coins, but we're actually going to come up with an Islamic system within this room. That's nice. That's cool. But some kids growing up in this room and they're going to be like, hang on, we, we don't agree with the casino system. We've come up with this thing over here. But shouldn't we just try and get out of the casino? Or shouldn't we just try and change the casino as a whole into something else? And I think that's where this underlying dissatisfaction comes from, because what we're dealing with is casino coins and no one has ever really attempted or properly articulated how we're going to change the casino as a whole. So that's really um, the rather modest attempt at uh, try, trying to you know, change the big, the big financial system out there. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. I think a lot of people also view it as, oh, because we're in this system that we just have to play by the rules of the system. So they tend not to think of getting out of the system, like you said. And I think that's, that's the issue, right? At heart, I think it's an issue about the scale of the vision and ambition. And I think we're now at that point in the Muslim community's journey and the Islamic finance industry's evolution, where we've done the basics. The early predecessors that came and created this industry and led that initial revolution and got things going and got the initial products off the, you know, off the, uh, uh, off the ground and got the regulation and the tax and legal issues changed to make it happen for us, great. They did a really important job. But now, where we, where we ended up in the early noughties shouldn't be where we stopped. And in 2023, we should be looking to now take the next step along in the journey. And that comes with just having a little bit more of an ambition now that is possible because of the work that predecessors have done. Okay, yeah, fair point. Completely agree with you there. So you've mentioned that there's a lot that's currently not going right. What we've got with the current Islamic finance industry is, as you described, people who've, who are using the casino but trying to like, create their own games, essentially. Um, so in order to figure out what would make a truly Islamic system, we first need to figure out 
where are we going wrong in the first place? So, so Ibrahim, where do we go wrong today? I think there's different approaches that people have taken to mu'amalat, Islamic mu'amalat and uh, Islamic finance in particular. There's three big buckets, I would say, that you've got the ultra cautious or perhaps conservative group, you've got the pragmatists or the practitioners, and then you've got, I think, the liberals. Now, the ultra cautious or conservative group say that, look, we are in this gambling, we are in this room in a gambling casino, and this is all haram, and therefore we should just avoid interacting with this stuff full stop. So they would say that, for example, Islamic banking and Islamic mortgages is not something to interact with. They would say that you might want to just continue renting uh, for the rest of your life. Uh, they might say that uh, in the stock market, you shouldn't have a 30% debt to asset ratio. You should just go for 0% interest uh, stocks or even if there are only a small handful of them. So they would take a bit more of a hardline approach. They would take a very cautious approach to these, perspect uh, to these issues. Then you've got people who are practitioners, right? Usually people who come from a conventional finance background or people who are in business. And they see this, and they're Muslims, and they have some sincere intentions as well. And they see this as a problem to be solved and they approach it from that perspective and they look at get Islamic scholars in the same room and say look we want to solve this financial issue or this investment issue can you make this work for us from an Islamic perspective and the Islamic finance scholars uh, the muftis are trained and our tradition trains uh, our scholars to solve problems and make it easy for people to transact so these Islamic finance scholars would get together with them and come up with products and that results in I think a lot of the products that we see today now the problem with this group is that perhaps they're a little bit more focused on uh, the commercial aspect or they're a little bit more focused on getting a, a, a document together or getting a product together that works as opposed to the absolute optimal or thinking about where do we want to be in 20 years time. They're more interested in getting the job done. Right, and, and then that thing fossilizes and sometimes you just stay there forever. And then you've got the third group, which is the uh, very liberal group. And they say that uh, the riba of today is not really the riba of um, the Quran or the Hadith. Uh, they might say that uh, because of necessity or haja even, we are, uh, we are required or we are allowed to do all of the stuff that is uh, classically seen as forbidden in Islam. And therefore there is no reason, there is no need for Islamic finance full stop. And in fact, we can just crack on and get on with it. Now, the problem with this group is that it doesn't really take any... I'm not going to go into the, the, uh, the argument around Hadith or Quran about how that might be the wrong approach. We just need to look around us at the, Islam, at the financial system that we live in today. Is it fair? No, it's not fair. Has it caused massive income inequalities and that are increasing over time? Yes, it has. Is uh, are poorer countries getting poorer and richer countries getting richer? Yes, they are. Um, have we seen prosperity uh, and 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 stability in countries that are the the bastions of the modern financial system? No, no, we haven't really. Um, and have we seen bank collapses and have we seen boom and bust cycles? Yes, we have. So with all of that, it's it's not. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that we've got a financial system that has clear problems in it. And uh, if we as Muslims are going to interact with that financial system, then surely we would look at our tradition, which has a lot of teachings and a lot of guidance around how economics and financial matters should work. And we should take inspiration for, from that on how we inform our uh, discussions around modern financial systems today, right? I, I, I don't think that's particularly con controversial. And I think even the liberals would accept that. Now, if we accept that the modern financial system is broken and we should be taking inspiration from our Islamic tradition for how we resolve it, then it doesn't really, then we can just stop there. I think the liberal argument doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. We can't just take the modern system as status quo and in interact with it. We need to change it because the modern system is not right. Even from a very secular, ethical perspective and moral perspective, there are issues with it. So Ibrahim, you said that the liberals and the progressives, they argue that the modern financial system is great, but you argue that it's broken. What's your argument for this? I think the modern financial system has a number of issues, probably three or four main ones. The first and major one is the nature of money itself. 
the way that money is created today is through the issuance of private debt by banks. And that means that the, the creation of money is in the hands of private bankers, which is hugely problematic. What do you mean by that? When, when uh, your, uh, your £10 note or your £100 note, where does that actually come from? That's only a tiny, tiny fraction of the wider money supply. The wider money supply, how much cash do you have on you right now? About 50 quid. Okay, and I presume you have a lot more cash in your bank account. Yep. That's where the majority of your cash sits. And that's the case with 99% of the population. So the vast amount of cash is actually uh, bank money. Because we call it cash, but it's actually just it's bank money, it's digital money. Mm-hmm. And so when, uh, uh, and so when an, a loan is issued, without getting really complicated about it, when a loan is issued by a bank, they are effectively just popping that money into existence. And they only need to keep a small amount of money in cash on hand to be able to deal with withdrawals because they know that no one is ever going to really withdraw money. Uh, and so what is happening here is synthetically the bank is able to pop money into existence and benefit from that because they're charging interest on that. Mm-hmm. Whereas when things go badly wrong and you have a bank run, because there's far more money that's been created than actually there is, when there's a bank run, a bank doesn't have enough money and a bank collapses and then the taxpayer bails them out and then we have to pick, pick up the, the burden of the, this failed financial system or this fail, failed banking system. And a bank run is? A bank run is when people get worried about a bank collapsing and they'll just start going there and withdrawing all of their cash. So if all of us say at HSBC, we're HSBC customers, if we all just started running and just taking all our money out HSBC of the bank at the same would time. All, all major banks would collapse because they all work on this fractional reserve system where they only need to have some money and they would then lend out or allow people to use a lot more than that. Um, and so money creation is a major issue because at a, at a higher level, what happens with money creation is it comes ultimately from the uh, sign off of the central banks. And the Federal Reserve is the largest central bank in the world. In effect, it's actually a private, it's semi-private as well because it's a, a group of uh, private banks that influences the Federal Reserve. But the Federal Reserve has this right to print money. And that means that those who are uh, closest to the origins of that money, like when, when you're a for, uh, forger or a, um, a counterfeiter of money, when you go out into the market, and you start spending, the first few times you spend, no one actually knows that there's massive inflation now in the system. You get the treatment with, for your coin as if it was actually worth what it was worth. But once a few weeks later, that money has spread through the system and there's loads of it, and there's now inflation, everyone now hikes up their prices. Um, mm-hmm. And so everyone suffers as a result of that. And those who are last in the chain suffer the most. Now, because our international system is interconnected and the origins of the main currency that props all of this together is what? The US dollar, right? Yep. And the Federal Reserve has the control to, uh, to print that. This means that inflation in the USA and this money printing in the USA actually spreads across the world. So someone in Zambia who is u- using US dollars, who will be far, far down the chain on the usage, eventually when the money gets to them, it will be money that is worth less and there's inflation that has crept into it. But those who are closest to the money printing, i.e. the banks, certainly the US banks, they actually benefit from it the most. And you can see this quite vividly where um, when uh, during COVID and any period where banks have printed a lot of money called quantitative easing, they will usually, uh, banks will usually put this money or lend this money into uh, economy industries where they can very easily liquidate and get hold of the security of those assets. And that's usually the stock market and the property market. And what happens whenever the banks uh, print money? You see both of these industries spiking and going through the roof because they are now absorbing up all of this liquidity Mm. and that's why they are getting propped up. So long way of putting it is that our money supply is, deeply unfair. It's linked to an interest-based debt issuance system, which in itself is problematic. And it's also inflationary. So we meet, need to move to a different way of money creation. We can talk about what that is in, uh, later on in, the, in, the, in this uh, discussion. The second big issue with our financial system is that it's an interest-based uh, financial system, i.e. we are really encouraging people to take out debt 
uh, use debt as the investment uh, as opposed to using equity as an investment. Now, what I mean by this is that people have money and people need money. Mm -hmm. And there is some kind of intermediary in the middle of those. Now, the, the, there are two ways for those people to get that money. Either it's a debt and mm -hmm. you would give a fixed return interest on that, or it's an investment and you give an uncertain equity return because they're now partners in that investment in some way, shape mm. or form. And because we incentivize debt-based investment by really backing the banking system and also by a fa favorable tax treatment of debt as well, what ends up happening is you see a huge amount of money flowing via the debt route. Now, the problem with the debt route is that, uh, A, it's unfair at heart. You've got interest um, being charged and people who are rich usually will have the assets and they're getting richer by charging interest. And there's no risk taking that is happening. B, the other big issue is that because they're not taking risk, they don't really care about what that money is being used for as long as they have some kind of security ideally over that thing. Now, what that means is that money isn't really being directly channeled into productive activities that are solving problems for the world. And instead, they are going into those things that are best suited for rent seeking behavior. So you see the property market is an ideal uh, platform for this because you can just rent out the property or you can charge uh, interest on a property loan and you've got the property as security there. But um, there are much more productive things that we could do with our lives and with our money than just focusing on rent seeking behavior. We could be looking to solve uh, climate change. We could be looking to um, progress on um, medical uh, research. There's, there are so many different things we can be doing that are productive, but also risky. But in the long run, this productive and risky behavior actually makes far more return, both for the individual who is investing and also for society at large, and particularly for society at large. Uh, whereas debt-based investments and debt-based transactions make a bit of a return, but actually in the long run, inflation creeps into all of this stuff. The system as a whole becomes decrepit and about to crumble. And finally, it isn't really beneficial for the wider society. And actually there's, um, without getting too technical, uh, you've got things called externalities, um, where you look at what is the benefit or harm to people who are outside of that transaction. And with an equity investment, there are positive externalities. People uh, who are outside of the transaction between AI uh, research lab that created the COVID vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, we, we are not transacting with them and we're not <coughs> in, investors in them, but we've all benefited as a result of that. That's called a positive externality. Whereas uh, we are not uh, party to the HSBC lending out money to its uh, to the different people who all hold its mortgages, but mm -hmm. we suffer a negative externality as a result of that transaction taking place, which is inflation mm -hmm. uh, and our money supply uh, becoming uh, it, it being uh, being problematic. So I think those are the two major issues with the financial system. There are other issues as well around uh, the use of derivatives and the use of things that are not tangible and so a lot of our uh, brightest minds and money is being used to trade derivatives and other uh, intangible things that are not actually it's just moving paper around without actually resulting in productive activity taking place in an economy and i, I think that's very problematic as well but i think the the first two issues money supply and this interest-based uh, system i think those are the two main issues with the modern financial system today so it seems like these problems that you've mentioned regarding the uh, modern financial system that we have, the major problems, clearly I'm pretty sure that other people are very aware of them, other economists. I know we've privately discussed loads of books written and um, other materials and resources where other people have pointed out the same thing. So if these major problems are there, we've got all these problems of uh, uh, inequality, the wealth gap, and they're only getting worse, why the hell have we not changed financial systems yet? Uh, there are very, very deep rooted uh, uh, power structures that exist today that would not want that to change. Now, can you imagine that the entire banking system that is based on this system continuing as it is, who also happen to control the wallets 
of everyone, including the government, like the government has to bank with someone as well, right? These uh, uh, entities, do you think they would be happy to change from where we are today to a different system? Of course not, right? So I think there's, there are very, very strong financial and economic interests that are completely against changing. I think the second issue is perhaps not as insidious and it's more just that there is no one who has come up with an alternative and if you aren't, um, if you, you aren't, if you aren't a Muslim or if you don't think that debt is bad or interest is bad in the same way that a Muslim does then there isn't as uh, strong an argument for you to, to switch over uh, I think there is from an ethical and from an uh, economic argument perspective as well. But all of the discussions we've had today have been economic arguments really and moral arguments as opposed to Islamic arguments. Um, but unless you're a Muslim, you don't necessarily focus in on that immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think the, the other reason why we just continue as we are is because uh, to get these kind of changes made takes a huge amount of governmental will and effort to be able to rewire an entire economy and also because everything is so international these days even if a country decided to make a change because they are one country as part of 250 other countries mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult for them to actually really see an impact as part of that so you would really need companies countries like china the usa russia the middle east the european union larger countries that have significant sway over the financial system to be able to make those moves in the first place for um, this to properly bed in. I was going to ask actually, like, if, for example, any one of these countries, whether it's, okay, let's be more realistic, we're talking Islamic system, if Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, for example, they decided that, you know, we'll, we'll be the, the first domino will start this system. Do you really think that without that, that one country by itself could start something and it could have an impact? Or do you feel like this is something that needs at least like a block of like 20, 30 countries, smaller countries to make it viable? Uh, I think it's better to obviously have uh, more countries, but it's uh, the problem of coordination, isn't it? So even if one country, I think, started, then I think this could be viable. And, and, and I think uh, we, perhaps we can talk about it later as well in terms of how you execute on a strategy like this. But I think, uh, you know, going gung-ho and targeting the financial system as a whole might not actually be the right approach strategically because it would cause a lot of raised eyebrows and a lot of uh, banks can shut you down, etc. And you can, they can make countries pariah countries as a result of that. I think the more interesting approach to take to this is uh, by focusing on the second issue, which is uh, moving away from an interest-based rent-seeking economy and much more focused on a growth and uh, an investment, equity-based in, uh, investment economy. Uh, i.e. in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, many, many people will, be, will have their money sat disproportionately, by the way, the Muslim community, Muslim world, disproportionately has its income sat, money sat in just cash or bank accounts or gold, um, things that are not productive. So the, the clever way to do this would be to influence these economies to start moving that cash out of banks, out of non-productive activity, into productive activity, into businesses. So that needs a big culture shift. I think it needs a big impetus from a government as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think it needs um, the, uh, a, a mindset shift from people to accept that there is gonna be risk, but there's going to be significantly more reward on average in the long run. Uh, and it needs uh, systems and it needs industries around investment management to establish properly as well. Like in Pakistan, it's really fascinating that there aren't actually that many large investment houses, but there are quite a large number of banks. And the reason is because the banks are not really that incentivized to create the investment houses. Because when you lend out money, Sharia compliant or not, you're gonna make a 5% return, 10% return on that. When you are taking that same amount of money and you're managing that for the next five years, you might make a 1% return, 2% return per annum maximum. It's nowhere near as much, right? And there's no magnifier effect that we talked about when you can create money out of nothing, right? So banks are not incentivized into doing that much investment management. And, I, and you will see that, by the way, in your own Barclays or HSBC or Santander account, 
where they will be selling you loans, uh, loan products and credit products, but the investment side isn't obvious, isn't as promoted and isn't as obvious uh, in, most, in most banks. Um, they might push the savings account because that's again, it's a credit and loan product, but they won't push the investment side as much. Some banks are different, but by and large, you will see that. And that's a really important tell as to the incentives for a bank. So coming back to the point around um, the, uh, the Pakistani system. Now, if over the next 20 years, that money was now going into technology, going into business, enterprise, and the, the Pakistani economy as a whole was growing, you can now have a much stronger position by which to make the move around the, the monetary system as a whole, because you have created so much growth that any potential harm or blowback from, that, from the changeover of the financial system isn't going to be as bad, and you can taper it in slowly over time as well. Like, you know, what we're talking about is a different financial system, right? A different way of doing money. So you could create parallel systems of uh, transacting between people that don't necessarily go through the existing rails of a bank using cards and wire transfers, uh, and you start embedding that in and, ha and you give it governmental support, and then over time, you increase that, right? And you, and you support that, that monetary rails uh, much more than the other monetary rails, and slowly the existing monetary rails, you le regulate and legislate around it, and you taper that down, until eventually you're on an entirely different monetary rails, and our money supply system is different in that country. And you now suddenly have a much more productive society as well, because you plan for it. But whether other countries and their central banks would like for that to happen, that's probably a different, more political discussion, right? Uh, I don't think the larger global banks would like this, for sure. So you, you would have to do this slowly, as I said, by stealth, right? The mm -hmm. first move is in the increase on the investment side rather than the debt side. That starts taking away the, the balance of power from the rent-seeking banking sector. And then you put in an alternative monetary system and then you wean off the existing monetary system. Now, if you do it in that staged way, mm -hmm. then I think that it's a lot easier, even for international, uh, the international community to see that direction of travel. And I think that they can, if you can prove out that this model works over 10, 20 years, and that someone like Pakistan, a country like Pakistan has gone from zero to 100 in that period of time, because they've just gone for this approach, that acts as a beacon far more than any academic book will about the success of this system. So rather than, uh, you know, sure, some of the other banking sector in other countries might be upset about it, but the leaders of those countries will be like, hang on, that's work there, let's do it here as well. And I think that Islamic finance isn't really just for Muslims. If we really believe that this is a financial system that is better, right, than what exists today, then it should work for everyone. So I think that's the way to do this. So Ibrahim, a skeptic might say that, look, we've had Islamic finance for 50, 60 years now. We've not really seen a kind of system change or a real alternative. Like what's going on here? I think the origins of Islamic finance and Islamic banking were not necessarily such that they were trying to replace the conventional financial system. I think what they were trying to do is they were looking at the financial system as a whole and thinking, okay, these are products that Muslims also need. How can we provide it to them, but also make it halal? And, uh, and so I think there was an element of replication and there was an element of uh, let's build a parallel product to a conventional product out there, um, which was at the heart of uh, of the of the pro uh, the project, and I think that's not a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. We do need to have a way to buy a home. We do need to buy uh, have a way to invest uh, our pension, for example. So the very origins of Islamic banking and finance, I don't think, were there to try and attempt what we're talking about today. And I think the second issue is that Islamic finance, uh, like any uh, corporate or commercial enterprise in the financial system is one that is uh, that wants to have defensibility built into it and so it's modern islamic finance like any commercial enterprise 
wants to have stability and certainty and defensibility built into it. What that means practically is in uh, modern Islamic finance, we don't necessarily share our know-how about how different products work, right? That's a proprietary secret. The, the documentation, the contracts and all of that stuff is like this hidden secret mm. that each company keeps themselves. And I don't think that's necessarily a particularly good idea because it stops the growth of, of, the, of the industry. And the second issue you have is that once you've got some certainty around a certain practice or certain set of contracts, uh, modern Islamic finance and the bankers don't necessarily want to move away from that mm -hmm. because they like the certainty, they like the fact that it's all now set up and we can just rinse and repeat this more and more. What we were talking about earlier, we are not a single point on this timeline, we are actually on a journey towards a certain endpoint. But modern Islamic finance, because of the nature of the system that promotes and encourages the status quo, which has stability and certainty to it, Modern Islamic finance doesn't buy into that. And so uh, for various different reasons, um, I don't think where we are today as an industry is uh, set up right to, to get us to, to the end point that I'm talking about. And that's not to blame the, the modern Islamic finance industry. I don't think that they, um, they have the infrastructure or the setup or the tools or even the incentives to, to, to do what we're talking about. Essentially, the modern is the people, the practitioners that are part of the modern Islamic finance uh, system, you could call it, um, prefer to play in the casino with their own game that they've created rather than venture out of the casino as we're talking about. To put it simply. Yeah, to put it really simply, to go back to the casino analogy, I don't think that they are, uh, they're bad people. Uh, mm. We've got this room, the Islamic room in the casino, right and where, where everyone is and they just haven't thought about the fact that you can actually just change the casino right no one's thought of that and uh, and the, the 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 middle level managers who are working who are running the room right they don't necessarily even have the skill sets to think about that for them they're just looking for a job do I go for a conventional bank or an Islamic bank? They just go for an Islamic bank because that's what they think is right. And then the, the, the job they go into, it has a certain training. It says, look, this if you do this, you get promoted. If you do this, you don't get promoted. You should stick within. The, these are the rules. These are the laws. This is the Islamic scholar that you listen to. Off you go. We can't expect that person to change, right? Mm -hmm. The change has to come from the leadership, but also outside the leadership from the masses and the acad academics and the media that influence the, the shape of the direction of this, uh, of this uh, group of people. Um, otherwise, a company or corporate is by its very nature set up to do a few things really well and just continue doing, doing those things really well. That change and that progress only happens in the few companies and, and actually like, you know, moving away from the financial system, you see those companies as uh, people like Meta uh, or Elon Musk's companies mm -hmm. uh, or uh, I think when Bezos was leading Amazon, they were really cutting edge. And the single determining factor here is all of these guys are founders. They are people who had that skill set to take something from zero to build it all the way up to where it is and they retain that ability to think from first principles and they have a vision and face and as Mark Zuckerberg says actually Facebook was doing this but now we're going to focus on the metaverse or now we're going to focus on this other thing and he does that and he executes that uh, and because he's a founder he has that gravitas and the skill set to be able to do that uh, and the same goes for most companies including Islamic finance companies and I think a lot of the time we, uh, we don't have those founder type people who are leading these companies. We've got uh, uh, the, the stewards, we've got the, the captains of the, the Navy as opposed to the captains of the pirate ships who are leading these companies. Um, and there is definitely a time and a place for captains of navies to be leading companies. But um, for, for, for the overthrow of the casino, I don't think the captain of the Navy is going to do that you're gonna need a captain of a pirate ship. So Ibrahim, we've got this dot that you mentioned is Islamic finance today, and it's on a journey. But clearly there's some things that are not, go, not quite going right. 
What would you say those things are that really need to be amended for us to really kickstart this process? I think the big, big, big thing that no one really talks about, but we have been talking about today, is the nature of money itself and the nature of the banking system itself. And Islamic banks are no different to conventional banks in that sense, in that they do also benefit from this power of money creation. And I think that is the main thing that we need to solve. Solve that and you solve 90% of the other issues, right? Because suddenly you take away this ability from a bank to print money. And now a bank, in order to make profit, needs to find out other things that make profit, which means that it's forced into equity investments. It's forced into productive, useful economic activity for the, for the wider economy. Uh, and that takes care of everything. We don't need to do any other work other than solve that main problem. Now, there are, I think, other issues within Islamic finance. And I think they're actually uh, lesser issues because they're derivative issues. And if we solve those issues, we don't actually solve the main problem. Uh, but those issues include things like Sharia wrappers, the use of Sharia wrappers, which are back-to-back -back SPVs that allow you to invest in basically anything that is haram. What's an uh, SPV? A, a special purpose vehicle. Oh, okay. So investing in anything that might be impermissible, but because you're doing it via SPVs and there's a complicated cash flow uh, adjustment going on, it means that the money that you get is halal, right? It's like mm -hmm. this laundry or this washing machine that you put haram in and you get halal out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's important to switch away from, but I, I don't think that's like, it's not a necessary condition. I think it's, uh, it's an important thing that we need to Im evolve as an Islamic finance in industry. And I think the use of commodity murabaha, um, and uh, we can, uh, you, can, you guys can Google what commodity murabaha is. We've written articles on it. Um, I think the excessive use of that, uh, where other products could be better used, is definitely to be encouraged. Um, I think those are the two main areas that I have I have concerns with from a from a structuring perspective. But as I said, the reason why commodity murabaha, the reason why Sharia wrappers are used, are because we live in a casino, right? Mm -hmm. And the Islamic bank room in the casino is trying to give uh, exposure to haram investments because there's so many because we're in a gambling casino. Uh, that's why they need to have Sharia wrappers in the first place. Or um, an Islamic bank is trying to work out an Islamic banking system, but at a certain point they're operating on the OS, right? The operating mm -hmm. system of riba, right? And because of that, they need to uh, use things like commodity murabaha to be able to... Uh, the commodity murabaha is a building blocks, the Lego pieces, in order for them to synthetically build this thing that is Islamic at this end, but they're piping into at heart a system that is un-Islamic. Uh, and so that's why they need things like commodity murabaha. But you get rid of that system as a whole, and suddenly you these kind of issues just fall away because everything has changed. You, you're out of the casino. The, 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 the conversation has changed entirely. So we've talked a lot about problems and issues, and this podcast has started to take a very, uh, I'd say, non-optimistic turn, a very negative turn. But now, Ibrahim, let's, let's get optimistic. What can we practically do to start thinking about things in a new way? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm actually really optimistic about this because I think we, all of what we've discussed right now is a deep diagnosis of the issue. But we want to solve it, and I think we can solve it. Uh, and I think the, there are um, organizations like Positive Money, whose work I think is great. Um, there are huge amounts of, uh, there's huge amounts, there, there are huge amounts of research pieces done around cryptocurrency and Bitcoin that explain how this could be an alternative parallel system. Um, and I'm not necessarily deeply read or knowledgeable enough yet, in my view, to really opine on what route and how the modern financial system, what the alternative could look like. But I think those are very important starting points to explore what an alternative financial system could look like. Um, so I think that would be um, a really practical, worked out solution that we can start deepening even further and think about looking to implement. So Ibrahim, can you give us a sense of how these solutions are any different? The, the difference with these solutions is that uh, you are moving away from 
money creation through the issuance of bank debt to money creation through the issuance of something else. Now, with Bitcoin, that's through mining Bitcoin. Uh, with gold, when we had a gold currency, it was through the mining of gold. And uh, with uh, the positive money argument, where you still have the issuance of money through the printing of money, but instead you put the ownership of the bank in the hands of the people, mm. right? And so they, they are, and then they are now uh, issuing that money in, uh, and printing the money and putting it into infrastructure investments for the for the country. So rather than going into stock markets and property, it's going into more productive activities, uh, and the people benefiting are the people themselves. Uh, rather than the private banks and this makes it a lot more uh, stable so goes the argument and a lot more um, equi to equitable as well now the argument on the cryptocurrency side is that this is in the hands of no one the money creation is uh, is a byproduct of the algorithm or a byproduct of the system or the the white paper and that's what determines what happens and so it doesn't matter if human beings are ethical or unethical, that's just the way it is. And this is an inflation-proof way of, uh, of money going up or down. And the same goes with the, the positive money argument, where they would say that because the bank uh, is controlled by the people, we can very effectively control money supply and make sure that it isn't causing too much inflation or causing too much deflation either. So it's, it's in the hands of the people. Um, I'm not, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, in, I think, well placed to make a definitive judgment for myself on this. I think this is something that economists and researchers and central bankers ultimately need to be looking at um, or, or academics who research cryptocurrency and, uh, and, and money supply, they need to be looking at. But I think those are two very interesting potential solutions to the problem. I also think the digitization of gold could be an interesting alternative pathway here as well. But all of these solutions at heart, what they're doing is taking away the creation of money power from private banks and putting it somewhere else. Are there any other practical things that we need to change to make this happen? So if you go back to the diagnosis, which was money supply and the monetary system is problematic, and also our investment and uh, liquidity landscape is there's, there's wrong incentives there, right? We're incentivizing debt, we're not incentivizing equity. I think that's the second area to focus in on. And, and I think there, what we need to do, and this is where I think IFG and our mission with Curate Capital is, uh, is really relevant and, and how I see us fitting into this narrative, um, which is that you need to give really viable equity investment options for people who have money to rather than putting it into the banks, they need to be putting it into this other stuff. And this other stuff is business, really. Because business is just another way of saying this is a loose collection of individuals who are coming together to uh, run an enterprise, make some money, but also solve big problems that are facing the world. A successful business is just a, a synonym for an organization that solves problems. And, and I think that's what we need to do more of. And the more technical and difficult problem it is that you solve, the more money that you make. Uh, and so we as IFG and other investment managers and other people in the Islamic finance industry, I think we need to create products that ultimately get money from people who have it to, more people, who are, to, to people who need it and who are doing uh, entrepreneurial activity. Um, and, and I think that with the change of the financial system, this stuff is going to become hugely more important because suddenly all of that debt money is now going to try and find its way into equity investments. And this is where, um, you know, uh, having these existing rails and having these existing systems set up will become hugely important because otherwise that money is not going to have anywhere to go. It's like saying to someone, your religion is rubbish, your religion is rubbish. Uh, and not giving them an alternative. If you don't give someone an alternative, you back a tiger into a corner, they're going to fight back, right? Mm -hmm. But if you give someone an alternative saying that, look, Islam is the right religion. Oh, by the way, there's some issues with your religion. You've now created a pathway, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that makes it a lot easier for that person to go down that path because uh, they, they've got the exit. Whereas uh, if you do it where your religion is rubbish and there's no pathway, mm -hmm. they're just going to kick back at you and say, no, my religion is fine. What are you talking about? because you've not given them an escape route. 
Um, so what I'm saying is that the uh, on the equity investment side, we need to really build that out and make it really robust, show people the great returns that are possible, uh, show people and encourage people and do, I guess, podcasts like this, where we are telling people that have money that you need to really think about where you're putting that money because that money is shaping the the nature of, of, of our economy as a whole. And that then shapes the nature of who, who wins and who loses in this economy as well. So yeah, I think on, on a final point probably then that what you're saying is from a more practical perspective for the our audience and relevant members like even myself, um, that we probably can't influence the money creation side of things. So that probably is something that needs to be solved at a higher level. But on the arguably, mo- arguably, um, but on the equity side of things, moving from debt financing to equity financing, that's something very much that we can actually influence by actually looking for these investments and actually parking our money into these things. And hopefully, you know, it snowballs. Yeah. And, and I think forget the Islamic or non-Islamic label for a second. I, with my own money, I am uh, actively trying to put it into either uh, venture capital or private equity capital or perhaps some real estate investment. Ideally, those kind of real estate investments that are adding value to the world by uh, being you know, robust landlords or uh, taking old de- degenerated land sites and building them into some new productive thing that then has a community built around it and you know, it creates flourishing and jobs, etc. Uh, I, I think that's where we need to be rather than classic rent-seeking behavior. Uh, and, and I'm not saying this is haram, by the way, And on the Curate platform, we will have some rent-seeking behavior type investments as well. But what I'm saying is that we need to have a shift away from that over time towards equity investments. Um, that's, That's what I'm getting at. A lot of what you've said sounds very nice, but I'm still not seeing the practical roadmap set out for us to really get to this system. Yeah. Uh, I think I think that's fair. Uh, I think the the practical roadmap, and this is where I go into the the, the last bit of my uh, my essay, where I talk about how we're a tiny company. You're an individual. I'm an individual. There's lots of other tiny companies. Even Islamic finance as an industry is really just a blip in the wider ocean. Um, what in reality is going to change this is uh, really quickly building up our economic strength. And I think the only place where you can really quickly build up economic strength is either uh, uh, controlling the money press, which we don't, unfortunately, because we don't run the Federal Reserve or the central banks, or by solving big problems and creating huge wealth through technology and other types of businesses. And that we can do. We just need to have the, the will and the motivation to do that. So that, I think, is the first thing. Then the second thing that I think we need to do as a community we need to be a lot more vocal about what we want. And hopefully, you know, this article is designed to be an articulation of what we would, should want. And then I think we need to tell Islamic banks that this is what we want. So Islamic banks who are custodians of a large amount of Muslim money, can you now start taking that money from rent-seeking behavior into productive activity, right? So I think I think this campaigning from the local, from 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 us as individuals and as a community is really important. I think then we need to get media onto that bandwagon as well. I think we then need to have policy and political changes as well. And then I think we need to uh, convince one of the central banks in in a Muslim land to run certain experiments. And I know I know people like the Omani government have made certain changes that are quite supportive to. Um, Uh, you know, uh, banning certain types of usage of uh, Islamic finance instruments and moving towards better uh, products, etc. So I think we need to win the ear of certain uh, central banks in Muslim lands that can affect this change at that level. Um, and, uh, And I think that that suddenly creates this pocket of wealth that otherwise is leaking out to Sharia compliant but mainstream companies like Shell or BP or whoever, Amazon, right? Which is, which is fine, but I would much rather that money, rather than propping up those companies, is actually being invested into uh, promising uh, decent sized Muslim enterprises in Muslim lands because that's how you're going to create 
our equivalents uh, of, of Shell, BP and Amazon uh, in, in Muslim lands. Um, and I think once that starts happening, you, you can actually speak with even more authority to uh, Islamic banks and central banks and governments and policymakers that look guys, this is working, this is where we need to put more of our efforts um, and, and just continue that dialectic. Um, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna be something that happens overnight, but as individuals, we can start voting with our feet. Rather than holding one in, in, in banks, Islamic or otherwise, frankly, we, uh, if we need to choose, I think Islamic is better, we need to be putting our money towards productive use. And if you're entrepreneurial, right? If, if you're an entrepreneur out there or uh, you run a business, make your business huge. And, uh, and if you're entrepreneurial and you're not actually doing something about it, run a business, come up with an idea and try and execute on it. It's riskier, but it's also going to become uh, much more rewarding if you succeed. And we need lots and lots of Muslims to take these risks because that's step one of the process. You can only back people if they, those people exist. If there are people who are trying to do their own thing, you can give them money. But if there aren't people trying to do their own thing, you can't give anyone money. And we're back to the rent-seeking behavior. But Ibrahim, I, I'd have a question on that. We, as Western Muslims, we're a very small percentage on the map. Even with many of us becoming entrepreneurs, does, it, does that really affect us in, on the Western side, or should we argue that we, sh we, whether we become entrepreneurs or not, the onus is more on the Muslims in the Muslim lands because the change is more likely to come from there? I think we live in a global world. People will be watching this from all over the world. Comment below if you're still watching and where you're watching from. And you'll find that actually people are watching from all over the world. Um, so I think the onus is on all of us. And even if I'm sat here, and I come up with a business. Today, most businesses will have an online aspect to it, if not fully online. And so um, it doesn't really matter what your location is. It matters what you believe and what you're doing it for. So this was a very riveting conversation, Ibrahim, very detailed. I have a lot to go away, go away with. Any final thoughts that you want to give to either myself or to the audience? Uh, if you are someone who could be an entrepreneur, then I think you should be an entrepreneur. If you work in the Islamic finance industry, I invite you to read our white paper. It's a start. I'd love you to comment on it, critique it, adjust it, write your own thing uh, and build on it because I think we need to deepen and deepen this vision and this end point. Uh, and, and if you agree with this uh, vision and you agree with some of the things that need to be done, then roll your sleeves up and crack on and do it, I think. Would, it would be my encouragement. Uh, and then I think if you're um, neither of those things, and uh, your uh, and this will be the majority of those pe majority of people who are earning and making some money. I would encourage you to think about where your money is sat, where you're deploying that money, thinking about uh, the impact you can have with that money because um, something might be halal, right? And we talk a lot about halal and haram on this on this channel. Something might be halal, but it might might not be the best thing still to invest in. So I would definitely encourage us to go for. Uh, to, to think about where and how we deploy that money. Um, and I think for uh, coming back to the Islamic finance industry and industry practitioners, uh, I think rather than navel gazing and uh, getting caught up in disputes about different types of products and what have you, uh, of course, I think we should clean up and tidy up some, of the, some products. The really fundamental stuff that really is going to move the needle is moving from debt to equity, doing that equity and investment piece really well, um, and then s transitioning ourselves as a system from an Islamic banking or banking system generally to a different type of system. Um, so I would encourage us to do that and, and not settle for compromised positions. So compromised positions like the 30% debt to asset ratio, compromised positions where uh, we're okay with um, you know, commodity murabaha, or even like with Islamic mortgages, um, you know, there's uh, there are there are some issues with it. Not settling with the okay position and going for that ideal position, um, and uh, and doing it in a in a scalable way, and doing it in a way that keeps the community with us as well, without throwing out the baby with the bathwater. 
Jazakallah Khair and Ibrahim for this engaging conversation. I'm sure I've taken a lot. I'm sure the audience has learned a lot. A lot of the articles and the white paper itself will be linked in the description below. So do check those out if you'd like to see the stuff actually sketched out in its full detailed glory. 13,000 words, I believe. So, that, so that'll be good fun. And do subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Until next time on the IFG podcast, Assalamu Alaikum.